Welcome back to the Get Unstuck and On Target podcast. I'm Mike O'Neill with Bench Builders, and with leadership coaching and people skills training, we help companies solve the people problems that are slowing their growth. Joining me today is Christina Proctor. Christina is an ADHD coach and a marketing and communications expert. Her lived experience of working through ADHD as an adult in a corporate environment that wasn't designed for brains like hers sets her apart, given her unparalleled expertise and insight to create powerful tools and coping strategies for ADHDers to thrive. Christina is the founder of NeuroDivergent Ventures. What a mouthful, Christina. NeuroDivergent Ventures. Welcome, Christina. Oh, thank you, Mike. I'm happy to be here. You know, I've fumbled with NeuroDivergent Ventures, yeah. namely because this term neurodivergent is something that I'm hearing more and more of, but I think there's a lot of confusion about what is it? Can you define it as you typically do so? Yeah. So neurodivergence is definitely a word that I fumbled with a lot in the beginning too, when I was learning about my diagnosis. So it's defined and how I use it is uh, people with neurological differences that result in unique uh, behaviors, perceptions, and the way we think. So it's different than what typical expectations would have. Mm. So I hate to put things in a box necessarily, but yeah. what will be the kinds of, of things that would fall under that umbrella? Yeah. So um, examples of neurodivergent conditions would be ADHD, autism, and dyslexia, for example. And so each one of those have different um, thinking patterns and behaviors. And it's common for people to have one or, or two of those at the same time. I myself have ADHD and dyslexia. And so when we have different behaviors, it could be sensory based. It could be um, emotional based. It could be lots of different thinking patterns, being able to connect dots that other people don't see initially, which is very helpful in the business world. The term. ADHD is bad mm -hmm. around a lot. It is. And um, I know that that as a quote diagnosis probably is a more common thing than it has been in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many variations of, of that. You yeah. describe yourself as uh, ADHD. What does that mean? So ADHD is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And there's actually three different what I call flavors of ADHD as described by the DSM, so the Diagnostic Manual. And so there's ADHD um, hyperactivity, and that's typically where people align their understanding of ADHD. It's, it's physically external. So like you had trouble sitting still in school, um, really having a hard time regulating emotions and stuff like that, especially as we grow. Um, there's also the inattentive type. This is typically what um, girls are assigned with uh, when they're younger or women are assigned with later. It's where our ADHD is, based, a lot of it's in our mind. So we have trouble focusing. Sometimes we're called ditzy or aloof, um, daydreamers. And we're told a lot if we would quote unquote just focus, then we would get work done or be able to do the work. Um, and so those, and then there's the combined type. And so basically that they have both hyper external hyperactivity and internal. Hmm. I appreciate that. I wanted to point out you and I met as a result of an introduction from yeah. our mutual friend, yeah. another Christina, Christina yes. Hooper. <laughs> Christina mm -hmm. is the founder of Sparkative and, mm -hmm. um, uh, she runs a business that, um, has found a real foothold amongst business owners mm -hmm. um, who could be described as neurodivergent. And so yeah. she's the one who introduced me to the term. And she said, oh, Mike, you got to talk to Christina. And I did. And I just said, well, let me bring Christina on the podcast. And let me tell you why. I had a, a couple of three reasons, probably. The first is just your expertise to your ability to explain that in a way that I found relatively easy to understand. Good. And three, perhaps most critically is I would like to kind of talk about what you've learned about yourself and in that learning, how you help others, if they find themselves similarly diagnosed, 
how can they excel in life? Um, and to some extent, I would also like to spend some time for us to kind of better understand that if this describes you, this is the podcast for you. If this describes someone, perhaps you manage, and mm -hmm. this also is the podcast uh, for you. So why don't we start with the first, um, ADHD in the workplace. You've gotten yes. through school, you're in the workplace. Um, folks who have it and or any other condition you wanna talk about, in what ways do they struggle? That is a such an amazing question. So um, I, try to really talk when somebody has ADHD and they're going to the workplace, they're moving from college or some type of school program, or even, you know, going directly into the workforce after high school. Transitions for people with ADHD can be very difficult because what got us to that place won't necessarily work anymore. So we typically have different types of coping strategies to address our ADHD. People understand that um, ADHDers have challenges with procrastination. Often that manifests in school that we're doing papers at midnight when they're due at 1 a.m., um, submitted online. And so that I am definitely guilty of that, getting into roles um, where I was woefully shocked at the transition. So really a lot of it is learning that transitions can be difficult and you won't know until you're in it that the coping strategies that you had before may not work anymore because you can't necessarily stay up all hours of the night to get something done. And the other part of that too, is that when it comes to procrastination and, and working in the workplace, you are beholden potentially to, with other people. You're, do, you're essentially doing group projects all the time, especially in a corporate world or um, any type of organization where you are you know, building through a major project. And so, you have to learn how to work with your ADHD in, in those specific environments instead of working against it and forcing your old coping strategies to be the solution. Christina, I was not formally diagnosed in school, but mm. I understand now that mm -hmm. um, I, I struggle with attention deficit. Mm -hmm. And the way I coped with it in school was list. Yeah. I would make lists and sometimes I would obsess on the list. I would spend more time making the list than doing whatever it is that needed to be done off the list. Yeah. Here's the irony for those who are watching. I'm actually holding up my list. This is the stuff that I try to keep in front of me. Yeah. Now, why do I share that? It took me until I got to graduate school mm -hmm. to figure out what system would work for me. Yeah. But when I figured it out, it made all the difference. That's but right. The point you made about transitioning from, from college to the workplace, um, that's important because you've had a system that you hope to find that works. Mm -hmm. Then you start all over again. That's right. I know you work one-on-one -on -one and you work perhaps even with groups with folks who kind of fall into this category. Um, you made a point that was interesting to me, and that is it's one thing to be responsible for your productivity, but when you need to contribute in a collaborative way, mm -hmm. is that particularly challenging for ADHD years? I don't think for ADHD years, when it comes to collaborating, collaborating and working together, that usually, I mean, once you meet one ADHD year, you basically met only one, right? Everybody has their different skills, but generally... ADHD years do really well when it comes to interacting and collaborating and thinking through and being creative and finding creative solutions. And they're amazing in a crisis, actually. And that's where the chemicals in our brain just function well, but that's not a sustainable model um, by any means. Um, but when it comes to working with people, when it comes to deadlines outside of planning, planning we usually can do in spades, right? Just like you pointed out, like I've got my list, I've got my process. It's the execution that sometimes we have challenges with. And that's when understanding about our brains and embracing our ADHD is really important and understanding how to support ourselves when execution becomes a struggle. Mm. So doing our part of the group work, our part of the project and being on time for it. Gotcha. You know, we talked a little bit about managing if this is what you are struggling with, but what if you're managing people on your team who have that? 
Uh, what is your guidance for the leaders who are listening in who may have one or more people on their team that kind of fit this definition? I remind them that it's not about micromanagement at all. It's about clarity. It's about, for them as leaders, being consistent with their staff and understanding that some staff members de- need different type of support. And that's how it is with every human on this planet. Everybody needs something a little bit different. But showing up every day and being your authentic self and explaining and being transparent about the requirements, uh, documenting the requirements, as well as ha- so having a place where people with ADHD or dyslexia or autism can go back and review deadlines, notes for meetings, uh, directions, or project plans is important. Because sometimes, like you said with lists, we, we forget or we get overwhelmed or we get sidetracked on another project. And having a place that we can go back and visit and encouraging them to create a habit out of revisiting it frequently, weekly, daily, is a great first step in that direction. I introduced you as wearing multiple hats. We're going to spend most of our time on the hat of being an ADHD coach. But when people reach out to you, Mm -hmm. what might be the things that prompt them to say, I'd like to talk to Christina? Uh, Usually it's talking about people who are either entrepreneurs or corporate professionals. Uh, They've seen some of my videos when it comes to uh, energy management, embracing your ADHD and growing your career on a higher level. Mm. Um, And you do and how I went about doing that and how I found what I wanted to do. And that's usually where they see me talking about energy management, Um, effective goal setting for somebody with ADHD, because we do better with different types of goal setting approaches. And that's how people usually want to end up talking to me. Mm. You know, I know you spent probably nearly 15 years in the corporate world before yeah. you started your, your business. How have you found the transition in light of what we're talking about to be, to going from a corporate environment to owning your own business? Mm. I was doing a lot of reflecting on this over the past couple of weeks, actually. And I realize now the first, I would say probably six to nine months, I was burned out. Mm. So I, the transition, I don't regret that. And I think that it was the best decision for me. And I've felt great ever since I made this jump into entrepreneurship. And I had to figure out how to self-motivate in the morning. So it was a huge transition for me to figure out what type of coping strategies I needed to get up, to get moving, to achieve, to contact clients, and to really learn what a healthy hustle looked like for me without burning myself out again. So it was, it was a transitional challenge for sure. I have friends who are in the corporate world and they Mm -hmm. say, oh, I'd love to have your lifestyle. You can do whatever you want whenever. Um, I don't mind confiding. And that is in the corporate world, I really excelled in that structure. Yes. I was in a leadership role. And so I had the advantage that I could surround myself with people on my team that could do things I didn't do well. That's right. And therefore I had folks to delegate. But Mm -hmm. the nature of the corporate role is there's a high degree of structure. Uh, This Mm -hmm. is pre-COVID, but you would be pretty much at the office at a certain time. You'd leave about the same time. Um, But when I started working for myself. There is no formality there. And I really worried that I would get distracted. Yeah. That something would catch my attention. And all of a sudden I realized I'm cleaning out the garage in the middle of the afternoon before, I mean, and, or the list goes I, on. I'm not, I'm not laughing at you. I'm just, it resonates so deeply. I, I share that just to say, I thought that I would be just chasing squirrels. Mm-hmm. And it really surprised me that when I basically put my mind to it, I think I am working harder mm-hmm. and longer and more focused yeah. now, in large part because I don't have the same degree of external distractions. That's right. I don't have people knocking on my door. Hey, Mike, you got a minute. Or mm-hmm. I'm not being drugged to senseless meetings or the like. I say that with you because I too enjoy working with entrepreneurs and business owners and those who make that transition, 
people think it's easy. It's right. not. It's yeah, accurate. It's it's hard. Um, and as a coach working with entrepreneurs, what do you find, particularly those new entrepreneurs who have ADHD or something similar to that? What is part of their biggest challenge? So there's a couple that I'm working with right now. Um, a big part of it is something that is what they believe, Dr. Dotson, who's an ADHD expert, um, and he believes it's unique to ADHDers, is rejection sensitivity dysphoria. So RSD. And so that is the perception that you could be rejected. And that's something that we struggle with throughout our life, right? And, you know, there's thoughts that it's genetic and environmental because as ADHDers, you know, we are redirected 20,000 times more than our neurotypical peers as kids. So we are constantly worried that we're not doing the right thing where we need that approval and we are constantly seeking. So when they're shifting into entrepreneurship, they had challenges with rejection sensitivity, worried about staff members, contractors, clients even. And sometimes working through those moments is a big aha where it's like, I'm here to help them. I'm here to support my staff or my colleagues or my clients. And is this a moment of rejection sensitivity? And what is it really rooted in? So that is something that I work with my, especially my entrepreneur clients on. Because it comes down to even having a challenge to invoice clients. Like, am I really worth invoicing this? And it's like, you did $20,000 worth of work for them and they agreed to this. Send the invoice. But it goes into that rejection sensitivity. And that also goes into those small tasks that are critical to your business getting completed. And so really those small tasks that are sometimes boring like invoicing and mixed in with rejection sensitivity can really make entrepreneurship a challenge for somebody with ADHD, for sure. For those watching uh, the video, they're seeing me kind of nod. You just described me pretty yeah. accurately. <laughs> and yeah. that is uh, and, and something that we didn't talk about, but I think it's somewhat related. Um, and that is, if that is a potential tendency, mm -hmm. The boring stuff is just that it's boring. You don't want to do it. Right. But at the same time, when you are self-employed, you're charging for your time. That's right. And you're invoicing and you're mm -hmm. asking them to pay you. And something we didn't talk about, but one thing I do find talking to entrepreneurs is they love what they do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But getting the business, mm -hmm. asking for the sale, if a person is struggling with this rejection tendency. Yeah. Then it's a kind of a double whammy. That's right. Um, do you find that that is oftentimes true? Entrepreneurs who love their product or love their service know that they're good at it, but mm -hmm. struggle with asking for business. That's right. Absolutely. And that fear of even potential, it really, because rejection sensitivity is rooted in the potential of being rejected. So doing sales can be challenging. And I do know some ADHDers who are excellent at sales because they are people, people, they want to solve problems and that's their bag. And then there's another pendulum swing and there's those of us who really struggle with the ask. And so that's when rejection sensitivity and honestly, even sales work, learning how to do sales was pivotal for me because that's when I learned how to work through my rejection sensitivity, being like, I'm bringing a solution to the challenge that they face. I believe in my product. Like this is, this is the way it is. And if they say no, then that wasn't the right client for me. And so going through sales training and understanding that it's more than just, you know, not accepting any less than four no's or something along those lines, learning how to do it in ways that work for you is the most important. I got you. You know, Christina, I know that you are a coach. You mm -hmm. also uh, provide uh, other services. Mm -hmm. Talk about those services. Yeah, so I'm a coach one-on-one -on -one for um, ADHD entrepreneurs and corporate professionals. Um, and then I also do corporate trainings on how to work with your neurodivergent staff. And maybe you yourself are a neurodivergent manager and learning how to delegate because rejection sensitivity can impact your delegation. 
um, as well as understanding about how to coach your own staff as somebody who's neurodivergent, as well as learning to work with your staff if you have staff who are, have ADHD or autism. So some of the trainings that I do are talking about how to best uh, project plan, mm -hmm. how to execute, and learn to do strategy with people who have neurodivergent brains. Um, and then I also, because in true ADHD fashion, we, ha we are multi-passionate individuals. I also do marketing and communication strategy with uh, large corporations and nonprofits. I can see how those two could marry up at the same time. Mm -hmm. now, the term, I don't know if you noticed that, but you used the term strategy two or three times. It sounds like that's a kind of a, an expertise of you helping individuals yeah. and teams execute on strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So that was one of the, the things I really enjoyed most when I was in corporate is strategy development, reporting, analytics, and tactical development. So really learning, we, you know where you want to go as an entrepreneur or business owner. The strategies to get there, the objectives and the KPIs and the goals, like that development is a, sometimes a different bag of expertise. And so working with leaders and managers and, and people who are implementing to help them understand and get behind the initiative and the excitement is something that I really enjoy and something that drove my passion in corporate. I can see that. Um, I can hear yeah. that in your, in your voice. Christina, reflect back, if you would, on a time where perhaps a client or even yourself got stuck. And what did it take to get unstuck? Oh. So yeah, there's so many situations running through my mind right now. So what I, I took a new job at a role in an organization and I was super excited. It was analytics based and I had been wanting my hyper fixation at that point had been data analytics and I'd mm -hmm. learned everything by being scrappy because that's what we do. We, if I don't know it, I figure it out. And that's part of the fun. And so I was able, through that scrappiness and development, I was able to get a job in a different department. And I, when I got in there, it wasn't what I thought it would be, which is totally okay, which is totally fine. Like it just, they changed the schedule up on me, which is those expectations and understanding. The location in which my office was, was not friendly to what I needed. Like it was mm -hmm. in a closet with no windows and I'm doing data analytics in a dark space. And that was a challenge. That was a challenge for me. And I got to a point where I felt like a failure because I'd gotten the job that I'd wanted and gotten to a point where I was doing the strategy and influence, influencing decisions based on those analytics and making good recommendations. And the I felt stuck because all of the, what you would probably call like job amenities wasn't working for me. Mm. Uh, location, time I needed to be there, the schedule changed frequently and I was in charge of the schedule and I had to manage it because they wanted us to be on call after I got hired. And that was not something that I wanted, nor what I mentally prepared for my transition. Yeah. So I felt stuck in this job that I enjoyed the work, but the workspace didn't work for me. And so I had to start working through what do I need and how do I get there? And so I, ha I started down that path um, and had to resign and go to, and I went back to my old apartment. <laughs> hmm. So I gave it, I gave it a try. I gave it a solid year and it didn't work and that's okay. Yeah, you, know, you raise an interesting point and that is there's so much that goes into feeling that this is the right fit. Yeah. The actual work that you were doing spoke to kind of who you mm -hmm. were, but where you did it and when you did it was very different than yeah. you anticipated. And it sounds as if it was constantly changing. And if I heard you earlier talk about um, folks with ADHD, we might think we want a lot of change, but we like things to stay the same because we figured out how to work through. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, all right. I appreciate you sharing that as we kind of step back and, and, reflect on your work with clients, your mm -hmm. work with client organizations. What might be some things that you think would be helpful for us to know that we haven't talked about? 
Yeah. So I think um, often when organizations are working with people who are neurodivergent, especially ADHD, we deal with stigma, right? And the stigma that uh, people with ADHD are lazy or they're never on time or they don't listen. And yeah, we have our own challenges just like everybody else, just like a single mother does. I myself am a single mother and we have challenges and there's other challenges that people who don't have ADHD have. However, the difference there is that the challenges these other people have are socially acceptable Mm. and ours come across as inconvenient. When in reality, if you are able to make accommodations, even just small accommodations, not even through your HR department, you're able to support your staff in ways that you never even knew could be possible. And some of the ways that I encourage managers to think, as well as it, clients that I'm coaching, is like, you can ask for what I affectionately call informal accommodations. That's not going through HR or disclosing that you have autism, dyslexia, or ADHD. I call it using, using your words. So we go by saying, I work best when. So in your interview, you can even say, if you're interviewing for a corporate accounting role, you can say, I work best when I'm able to come into the office early so I can focus on my work before the hustle and bustle starts. Is that something that I could do in this role? It's non-invasive. It's not disclosing. You are communicating your work needs in a way that is socially acceptable. Do I want to live in a world where the stigma is not there? Absolutely. However, it's important to acknowledge that it is and to, for some people, you have to learn to work within that world and you can while other people are trying to fight and elevate the awareness and understanding of neurodivergence. And so I bring that up because it's so important to me for people to understand that there are lots of people who have ADHD, dyslexia or autism who are heavily masking at work and it takes a lot of energy um, to be perceived as not these things. Um, And we're learning all the time to figure out how we can adapt to the environment versus us coming together and working and figuring out how we can work together. And so I let the employers know that the onerous has always been on the employee informally and formally. And coming together can really alleviate that stress for the staff member And you will see them be able to work in ways that they haven't before because they're not having to take those other things into consideration. Christina, you used a word a moment ago called masking. Yes. Yeah. And that that one word just the things went through my mind immediately, and that is um, people who are who have these issues uh, oftentimes are masking, and that effort to mask Mm -hmm. is taking yet more energy. Yeah. Um, I also just kind of skipped over, not intentionally, uh, dyslexia. Mm -hmm. In large part, I don't really know much about it. Um, For those who are not familiar with dyslexia, what what is it and and in what ways does it manifest? So dyslexia is, um, there's lots of different theories about how it's executed in our brains and our eyes, but uh, to keep it super simple, it's basically where sometimes we see things um, shift and move. It's not like we see the letters shake on the page. It just literally is, we might see the word, for example, technologies, and I'll see the T and I might see the S, but all the letters in between are kind of jumbled a little bit more. Mm. And so that's what I see. And so as I'm sure you can understand, it makes reading really difficult um, and sometimes grasping new concepts difficult. Once we get them, we get them. Um, And there's lots of different ways that people can experience dyslexia. There's also something else called dysgraphia where that impacts, um, no, dyscalculia is something where numbers are hard and understanding time is even harder. Hmm. Um, So that can obviously impact work. But if you're a graphic designer, Um, sometimes that's very beneficial because people with dyslexia have a tendency to think in three dimensions. Mm. So if you think about three dimensions and you think about letters, is there a letter in the alphabet that when you move it up and down and over, that it's the same letter? You think about B, P, D, and Q. 
Yeah. So that letter could be very difficult for somebody with dyslexia. Mm. And so spelling is difficult sometimes. Grammar is difficult sometimes. And those are things that are really, you can support those in a lot of different corporate roles through tools like Grammarly. Run something through a spell checker. Grammarly is great um, because it goes into grammar a little bit deeper than like a Word doc would. Um, it can also sense tone. So that gets into tools with uh, somebody who has ADHD or autism where we aren't always able to sense tone that we're using in emails. Um, but that is what dyslexia is, and that's how it can impact uh, somebody in di- a role in corporate. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. yeah. Christina, we've covered quite a bit in yeah. this conversation. But for those who are listening, or watching, what do you want to make sure that they take away from this conversation? Yeah. So the if you have ADHD and you're working in a professional role or you're an entrepreneur and you are trying to figure out why you are struggling or you are like, I'm doing really well, I'm succeeding, but I'm exhausted all the time and I'm just on the verge. Like, and if one thing goes wrong, you crack. The biggest thing I would say to start to do is something called energy management because ADHDers, our energy can ebb and flow. Um, It's the same thing for people with autism. We can have really high energy one day and low mental energy. We call it, we don't have a lot of spoons today. We just don't have the mental energy to do it. I don't have the spoons. And I woke up this morning for this podcast and I was like, I've got a lot of spoons today. I'm so excited. Um, And so I would say, look into energy management and start tracking um, how you feel, how your brain feels. You don't have to do it super in depth. It's really meant to be, uh, on Tuesday, I felt this way, high, medium, low. And these were the tasks that I had. And over time, you can start to see, oh, when I have this meeting on Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm spent. I see now that on Wednesday mornings, I need to make my time a little bit more fluid so that I can rest and do tasks that don't take a lot of mental energy. And so when we try to force ourselves into doing work that we're not down for, it creates way like we run into an energy deficit. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would start with energy management. The next thing I would do is to do goal setting in a way that makes sense for you, which is taking energy management into account time of year, responsibilities, and things that you're interested in. Because sometimes we'll go after things that we think we should want, and we actually don't. We start taking on other people's goals as our own for acceptance into the rejection sensitivity. Um, and that's for entrepreneurs as well as professionals. So those are, those are things I would leave, leave people with and them to know. I'm confident, Christina, that people who are listening to this podcast have heard something and they say, gosh, I want to learn more. What is the best way for our listeners to connect with you? Yeah. So my website is neurodivergentventures.com. If that's too much of a mouthful, if neurodivergent is new for you, you can find me on TikTok and Instagram doing educational videos. And that's under ADHD coach K Tina. We will put that including the website address in the show notes. Um, I want to make sure I do have your TikTok uh, handle too. So if I don't have that, make sure I I get that so we can include that um, in the show notes. You know, Christine, I knew that we're going to have an interesting conversation, but I'm so pleased, one, you woke up with lots of spoons. Yes. (laughs) Um, I I too. Uh, And so we're we're recording this uh, relatively early in the morning. your energy is high, your yeah. ability to communicate complex ideas is very, very good. Thank you for sharing your expertise today. Absolutely. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, Mike. I appreciate it. I also want to thank our listeners for joining us today. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can just go to your browser and type in unstuck.show. While you're there, If you like, you can also subscribe to our weekly management blog called The Bottom Line. So if you're trying to grow your business, but people problems have slowed you down, let's talk. Head over to bench-builders.com to schedule a call. So I want to thank you for joining us. And I hope you have picked up on some tips from Christina. They'll help you get unstuck and on target. Until next time.